Welcome to the New Abbey YouTube channel. We are a Jesus community telling the biggest story of God in Los Angeles, and we're excited that you're joining the conversation with us today. Enjoy. Uh, well, I'm excited to continue our series. If you missed last week, this entire year for all of 2022, we're going to be going through the Torah, so the first five books of the Bible. It's going to be fun. Was that a clap? Was that an accident? Was it an accident? Yeah. I was like, wow, I didn't expect that. Um, and so I'm excited to continue on in that conversation this morning. But before we get started, we're going to have a little conversation. So uh, grab three or four people around you. And this first question, what are your current thoughts about social media? <laughs> Enjoy. All right. Well, I'm excited to get into this conversation today. Uh, so we are, like I said, in a series where we are going through the first five books of the Bible all year. So right now we are in the book of Genesis. And so uh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to give us a passage and then we'll talk a little bit about it. We're going to have some conversations. It's going to be great. It's going to be a good morning. Okay. So we are in Genesis 4. This is a fun one. Uh, now, Adam had sexual relations. <laughs> I feel like I didn't read that translation. It was That's funny. Um, he did have sexual relations with that woman, uh, Eve. And she became pregnant, and when she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. <laughs> I love that that was on its own screen. I have produced a man. Uh, later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? What a funny... This is great. This is like... <laughs> you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Oh, wow. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. Bum, bum, bum. But you must subdue it and be its master. Genesis 4, 1 through. Is that the translation I sent? My bad, Frankie. That is not the one. That's a good one, though. It's, you know, they're all, they're all there. Um, so there we have the story of Cain and Abel. Who's heard it before? Yeah, this is a, a, a fun one because this story is like, I mean, it's been everywhere from like Shakespeare, like a, it's in a Lauryn Hill song. Like this is just, this is what we talk about, right? Cain and Abel, it's like the first murder we see in the Bible, which what a fun place to go on a Sunday morning. Um, but as I was, have been reading through Genesis and uh, reading about this passage, and let me tell you, people love this passage to go into it. And for eons and eons and eons, there's a lot of missing pieces here, right? There's a lot of missing pieces to this puzzle of like, wait, did God not really reject Cain's offering or did Cain? I feel like they did because then the relationship between them never ends and then they're still having this conversation and God's like, why do you look angry? And there's so many things. And then not to mention, there's like all this commentary on like uh, translations and who is reading it and the historical context of like agriculture versus like farmers and what they were doing at that time. And there are millions of things all, none of which I'm going to get into, um, but feel free to like go deep. If Corey was here, he'd be like, all right, 1050. And I'm like, no, I guess. Um, he could probably tell you all about it. But one of the reasons that we're going through the first five books of the Bible, and I'm excited about it, is uh, there's just ancient wisdom here. There's, there's wisdom uh, all over it. And, and a lot of times we're not meant to take it. We always say take the Bible seriously, not literally, right? Um, and so what is the wisdom in this story? And as I'm thinking about it in our lives today in Los Angeles or wherever you're watching from in 2022, I think there is a lot of wisdom here, right? Because at the end of the day, one of the core uh, sort of themes of this narrative is comparison, right? It's this idea that I think we are all very accustomed to. 
So you have someone who is understanding their experience of their relationship through, with God through someone else's experience of their relationship with God, right? Here's what I bring to God, here's what they bring to God, and here's how I interpret how God responds to it, and here's what happens, right? And uh, I stopped reading, and I don't know if I missed it, but did he, ki- he kills, Cain gets so mad he kills, that's a major plot point that I don't think we even, um, kind of skipped right over that one. Cain gets so mad he, he kills his brother. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But this reality that we have learned how to exist sometimes as humans in in comparison to someone else. We've understood our relationships with the divine through uh, someone else's relationship to the divine, right? We do that. Sometimes we can't help it. We've been sort of like accustomed to do that, right? We understand if we're nice, if our parents, do my parents like us? Does my teacher think I'm smart? Do my friends think I'm funny? Am I good at this sport? Am I good at this sport? I just need other people. I'm understanding myself through the lens of other people, right? And sometimes you can't help but compare. You compare wins. You compare losses. I think a lot of times we compare suffering. Sometimes we just do, right? Um, Can I tell you all the story about... um, the time I shared an office with a man. Um, <laughs> did not expect that level of enthusiasm. So uh, I, sh- I had a job, you know, like a little office job, and I shared this office with a man. And it was one of those days, I was having a day, right? I was having one of those mornings. Anyone in the room who menstruates, you know the kind of day I was having, OK? Yeah, we're going to go there? We are, OK? We're already talking about murder. So. Um, <laughs> I'm having this day, and it's just the worst. I'm having the worst experience, but what do I do? I go to work, right? Because I have a silly little presentation with this man who I share an office with. So I'm having just this awful time. You know those, like, um, heating pad things you can, like, stick on your back? I have one of those, like, button and zipped into my jeans just to, like, try to bring the pain down to, like, a, you know, whisper from a scream. And, you know, I've got so many things going on, but I'm like, I just show up to work, you know? And I'm in my office, and like 10 minutes into the day, like I just, this man I share this office with just starts doing this. Okay. He's like, oh, is, oh. <laughs> and he's like, then he starts asking, like, is the weather, is the weather changing? <laughs> so finally, I'm like, D- is something wrong? And he's like, <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, I think the weather's changing. I have an old football injury. So I'm like, fine, I'll bite. Do you play for the Rams or, you know, something? Or like USC or what? You know, and he's like, oh, just high school. (laughs) So then I'm like petty already. So I'm like, varsity? Like I need, you know? And he's like, no, I've, you know, only one, one year JV hurt my shoulder. I'm like, not me having a heating pad buttoned into my pants. I'm like one really strong sneeze away from our office becoming a crime scene. And you're literally like asking me if the weather's, the weather never changes. We pay millions of dollars to live here because the weather literally never changes. And you got hit one time in JV football and the whole day, oh, oh, oh my God, nothing, you're fine. Right, okay. Sometimes you compare suffering because you're winning, okay? And you just naturally, you can't help but do it because you're right, okay? I get it. This is humanity. We've all learned this. Even if you grew up in the church, especially, you compared yourself constantly to what? Jesus. And guess what? You always came up short, okay? And even if you didn't grow up in the church, we just learn how to understand ourselves through someone else's experience, right? How many people, when you were a kid, your you know, parents or whoever, they're like, eat your vegetables because someone is starving, right? We're understanding how to be because how someone else is being. And there's a lot of like grief for me in that because it wasn't our fault. We literally were put into a world that taught us how to understand ourselves through the lens of someone else. There's a lot of baggage that comes with that, and I feel like the gospel and the message of Jesus is constantly asking us to break that down. 
to get to a place where we understand ourselves and our connection to this divinity for ourselves, and out of that is where our response comes. That if we can do that, then maybe what the story is telling us, we could stop before we get to the violence. Because we know that as the comparison grows, the violence grows. And violence of all kinds, by the way, right? Have you seen social media, <laughs> right? We are consumed with being on the right side, in the right corner, with the right words, with the right thing. And the only way we know if we're right or not is to compare ourselves to someone else's experience. And I don't think that's working. <clears throat> didn't work for Cain. Really didn't work for Abel. <laughs> like you knew him. Frankie's like, oh. Um. <laughs> And I'm starting to understand and believe that our job in the world is to mind our own business. And I mean that in the realest sense of the word. And I don't mean that in we ignore the suffering and the pain of others. I don't mean that in that we don't confront the unjust systems of the world. I mean that in that if we can understand our own dignity and believe in our own dignity as humans, then we have no reason to not believe in the dignity of every other human and act accordingly. But that does not come from pity. That doesn't come from I feel so bad for you or I need you know, uh, sparkles in my crown or whatever it is that we were promised <laughs> or I'm going to do this because it looks good or I'm going to do this so I can post it or I'm going to do this so I can stop the, my own shame and my own guilt. I'm going to do this because I believe so much in my own dignity and divinity that I have to believe in yours, and that's why I do it. Amen. Right? <clears throat> but that's really hard. So I, um, in, in prepping for this week, I came across this uh, Rumi poem that I would like to share with you all. I said, what about my eyes? And they said, keep them on the road. I said, what about my passion? They said, keep it burning. I said, what about my heart? They said, tell me what you hold inside it. I said, pain and sorrow. They said, stay with it. The wound is the place where the light enters. <laughs> really be using words. Um, <laughs> and what gets hard about this and what gets difficult is that understanding our own divinity and dignity and our connection to God and all of these things often requires us to let light into our wounds, to let light into places that we would rather keep covered. But, in the words of Richard Rohr, if you don't transform your pain, you transmit your pain. And so what looks like us bringing an offering to God is actually us bringing our unfinished and, and untethered pains and wounds onto the people around us. What looks like us doing X, Y, Z, whatever it is, is that pain showing up. Sometimes I think about in my fight towards racial equity, I ask myself, do I want equity because I believe in the dignity of every human being, or do I want someone else to hurt because I've hurt? It's 50-50. I'm working on it, right? Do I want, I feel so much pain, so I want someone to feel pain sometimes, and that is where my actions come from sometimes. I'm not above that. But I am trying to understand that in transforming my pain, I get to do the same work, but it looks a little bit different. I'm never not going to confront those systems. I'm never not going to confront the injustice. But if I can come from a place where I am understanding that I want that because human beings are good and everyone does, is deserving of life and dignity and all those things, then it looks a little different than me saying, I hurt, you're about to hurt. I think the most dangerous thing to all of the systems of power is a person who is free of the expectations of the world around them, is a person who has seen their own dignity and their own divinity? I say this all the time. I think our <clears throat> the world's reaction response to, to our 
our non-binary, gender non-conforming, and trans community, I'm like, oh, it's scary to you that someone can be that free. Oh, it's scary to you that someone said, every box that exists, I just stepped outside it. And guess what? I'm living, right? Because if they can do that, then they might help us get to that place. We might then be free. And that's really scary to every system of power that's set up, right? And that's why, one, we need community that is diverse. And two, we need people who are free from those expectations. What does it look like to get to a place where we are so transformed and have let so much light in that light gets out? And here's the interesting thing. Sometimes I, I look at my life and I'm like, I could be doing the same, the action is going to be the same, but the motivation is so different. You ever notice that? Like something simple like with like exercise, you ever just be out there and be like, I love myself, I'm going like, to move my body. And then you're like, I hate myself, I'm going to move my body, right? <laughs> Running down the street, looking the same, right? But what's going on in my mind is extraordinarily different. <laughs> and last week, I love what Corey was talking about, being good in the world and doing good in the world and letting light into the world. And I thought about the fact that so many of the things that I wanted to do when I was younger, super evangelical, understanding myself through, you know, what people thought of me, pastors, Jesus, all of these things, and what I want to do now are actually kind of the same, right? I want to bring good in the world and light in the world and healing in the world and hope in the world. The only difference is now I understand that if I can't bring that to myself, I don't know how to give it to someone else, that I can't give what I don't have. And so now I get to go on that journey of saying, well, well what, if it, what if I didn't focus on someone else's offering? And what if I did let the, the light into the wounds? And what if I did get to bring good from a place where I just believe in the good about myself? And so then I believe it about you. And then I'm actually engaging in the, in the same work, but it just feels a little different. As so I was thinking about this morning, <clears throat> I know we live in like the wildest time. Like in 1995, there wasn't a single person on earth who had ever bought anything on the internet. Like that should blow all of our minds, right? <laughs> and the fact that we have something so readily available to just constantly critique our own identities against is terrifying. It's terrifying to me personally because not only do we have all these things where we get to compare ourselves to other people, now we have opportunities and the stakes feel a lot higher to be right, right? Does anyone just feel like the constant pressure to just like not do, say, think, post, be anything wrong? Oh, just, okay, only me. <laughs> right? And, I think our quest for humanity and our own humanity needs to be stronger for our quest to be right because our quest to be right will always have violence nearby. But humanity is complex. It's nuanced. It's messy. It kind of sucks. I personally feel eh about it. But in our quest to be good, in someone else's eyes, our quest to be right, our quest to be thought of in a certain way, our, our quest to be better than or all those things, violence will always be nearby. But our quest inward towards transformation, I think, is where we get to bring transformation and good. One of the things that's like complicated for me right now in my life is like, <clears throat> you guys ever just like leave evangelicalism and then you're really mad and then you go on this like deconstruction journey and then you kind of end up and you're like, am I kind of in a similar place as I, <laughs> and you're like, wait, did I? I took, a, I took a left, but it looks like a right. Um, and I think it's beautiful. 
I think it's so beautiful. I was talking to uh, my therapist about <laughs> trauma. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> as one does, thank you. Um, and I, you know, I, I always say like, oh, I thought I was over this, you know. Um, and she always tells me it's like, it's a spiral staircase. So I'm gonna see that thing. We're gonna see it from this angle. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna cry about it. It's gonna be fine. I go about, next thing you know, I'm like, oh, boop, <laughs> not you again, right? But now I'm at a different, I'm seeing it from a different angle, right? And I might continue to bump into this thing for the rest of my life, but I'm gonna see it from different angles and different angles and different angles. And I don't see my faith and my belief and my relationship with God any different. That it's gonna be there for the rest of my life, and I'm gonna see it from different angles and different angles and different angles and different angles. And parts of those threads are gonna stay true. That's what I felt like reading this passage and thinking this morning of like, I want, I still want to do, I still want to change the world. I still want to bring hope and light and love. And now I don't need to like get on a plane and go to another country and be like, oh, like, do you want Jesus, you know? Now, <laughs> I know that so much of it is coming from transforming my own pain. But I still want the same things. I'm still, I'm still looking at that same beautiful picture, this idea, this reality that Jesus paints. And I'm looking at it from a different angle, and that angle is looking right back at me and saying, okay, girl, well then, right? That's beautiful, and I love that. We don't have to abandon all of the things just because we deconstruct and we do whatever, and if that's where you are, that's fine. But if you're in a place where you're like, no, I still want to like be hope and light in the world, that's freaking beautiful. But we grow up a little and we realize, ah, a lot of that starts with me. That's beautiful too. It's harder. I'd rather jump on a plane. I don't know. God's calling me to Fiji. <laughs> but that's not the case. So we are going to get back in our groups, talk about this question. What is one thing you can do to move towards yourself this week? If you like that question, talk about it. If there's something else on your heart, honestly, talk about that. <laughs>